Okay, so we're in the process of investigating a um, scenario earthquake that um, would occur on a straight um, approximate segment of the Olinghaus Fault, uh, which is just east of Reno. It could be, um, but geologists haven't tracked it, it could be that uh, the fault comes right into uh, East Sparks. Um, or, as you can see uh, from here, maybe it's conceivable that it connects up with the, um, the jump in the um, uh, the jump in the um, uh, normal fault systems that uh, that occurs uh, at the Steamboat Hills, which is uh, Steamboat Hills are right in here, and you know this uh, swarm of faults here across the Mount Rose Fan is um, uh, probably the north end of the um, uh, Genoa Fault System. And there are other faults uh, now that we know better uh, after Roxy Freire's uh, master's thesis work that connect right up into um, uh, right up into east of downtown along uh, Holcomb uh, Lane, and then uh, we know now uh, from uh, work we've done with the USGS and seismic reflection surveys that uh, uh, we know exactly where the uh, this fault system. Um, Crosses the uh, uh, the Truckee River, and uh, uh, perhaps my uh, current hypothesis is that uh, the fault extends uh, up uh, as far as North McCarran, McCarran Boulevard along the east side of uh, the UNR campus. Um, where the Oling House uh, goes um, is uh, um, you know the subject of uh, much speculation. Uh, between uh, geologists here, it uh, could branch off the uh, sort of being being a, a left lateral accommodation zone um, between the offset of uh, of uh, or that that sort of forms a boundary between uh, the uh, Carson domain of the uh, Walker Lane and this domain north of Reno that includes. Uh, uh, smaller normal faults instead of uh, you know large um, extensive normal faults, and um, uh, so the left lateral motion could originate uh, down here in the Steamboat Hills, branch off the uh, uh, the Genoa fault system, and run along the Truckee River and Interstate 80 uh, up to the uh, 18. Uh, does anybody remember the uh, the rupture? Uh, uh, the earthquake date uh, on the, on, that's assigned to the only house, the historic rupture, 1886 or something. Yeah. So uh, those scarps all could connect. Um, there are swarms of faults. You know, in Nevada, uh, you're always within spitting distance of a fault. Um, so you just can't escape them anywhere in the state. And um, what, uh, what we need to do is assess uh, which ones are most hazardous, and um, certainly the Oling House is one of the closest large ruptures to the, the Reno Sparks metropolitan area. So we'd like to know what can happen then. Um, you know, what is uh, what is the potential there for uh, uh, for rupture, and uh, how would that shake Reno? So we constructed in the MACME interface, uh, we constructed a, an input file for uh, E3D, uh, which is the one we're using here. Um, the WP4, which is Livermore's most recent um, software, is, um, uh, takes similar uh, inputs and uh, many, more, uh, many more varieties of input data besides. Um, it's going to make parts of uh, of uh, MACME obsolete, um, but uh, for now we can uh, run using the uh, old uh, E3D uh, code, which is still uh, you know quite useful. It's been vetted uh, in shootouts uh, run by SCEC and EERI against uh, several other codes and and verified um, 
that it produces accurate results in a number of, of uh, test cases. Uh, when running these sorts of models, you have to keep in mind that uh, uh, you know it's never the, the the code. I don't care if it's uh, WP4 or Kim Olson's code or or uh, or E3D. <clears throat> it's never been vetted in the exact situation that you're feeding it. So you have to um, you have to uh, test it against uh, validate it against uh, recorded data if you can. Of course, for a uh, a magnitude um, seven scenario in the Reno area, we don't have any recorded data. Um, so uh, it would behoove you then to uh, uh, take recordings of a smaller earthquake at least and uh, validate the code against um, against those in in the area that you're trying to compute a scenario. So that's uh, you know really the basic work of the um, of the scenario modeler. Now, um, when we saved this, um, this input file, which we named olinghouse.in, um, which you uh, probably won't be able to read on this eventual screen um, in, the, in, the, in the movie, um, when we saved that, uh, uh, we also got another file, this uh, file called run.sh. That's the script that will run this. And so just... Um, let me show you that, and we're going to modify it just slightly at the moment. Um, and uh, wow, there's obviously a, a bug, uh, although it, this will work. Um, the uh, um, uh, so. Um, there are uh, a couple of things happening here. Um, we may have, uh, in the process of adopting a uh, a, um, uh, a rules file, if we had adopted a, a pre-configured rules file instead of uh, sort of configuring our own within MACME, um, we may have um, uh, wanted to replace our uh, our rules.java file. All right. Um, so there's uh, the compiled rules class, and down here is uh, uh, rules Java. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So um, I can hardly see it on my own screen. Um, and uh, um, I'm uh, interesting. Um, uh, amazing text edit is uh, is refusing to open it. Okay, well I can always open it in um, um, in Apple's uh, software application, or I can download an application like uh, Text Wrangler. Yeah, I don't I don't have that right now, okay. but um, yeah. Uh, anyway, these are I have a couple of, in in the um, in the data folders. I have a couple of pre-configured rules files for uh, certain areas. So the first thing you might do is uh, replace the um, replace the rules file with um, um, let's see. I'll try to open it. Uh, Directly from here, um, let's see if it'll open from within. Well, who knows? Maybe I'll crash my whole system now. <laughs> this is amazing. As you said, welcome to uh, uh, Yosemite. Yeah, so Text Wrangler will uh, will take care of that. <coughs> BB Edit is another old favorite uh, that I've used also in the past. The bare bones editor. That's the A version of Text Wrangler. Ah, is that the case? Okay. Yeah. 
$75. Yeah, I, I, uh, I used to use it uh, in the past, and uh, it had a lot of great features, so I, I would probably be willing to, uh, to pay, pay that much for it again. Uh, but I'll check out Text Wrangler and. Uh, what if you rename it Java.text? Yeah, that will probably do it. But uh, all right. So what I'm getting at is that if you use a, a special pre-configured rules file, you will want to delete the uh, rules.java that is uh, that is here. Okay. There's rules.java, and. Um, uh, and uh, replace that. Uh, uh, you'll have a rules. Um, you'll have a rules. Uh, you know, dash uh, uh, Las Vegas that uh, that will replace that file, and you'll just rename that uh, that pre-configured rules file into rules.job. What that means then is that you have to compile all the Java codes together, because there are two steps here. Now we are. We are not replacing the file, so we and we have everything already compiled, so we don't need to uh, we don't need to recompile it. I mean, maybe I should because then um, uh, then I won't uh, I won't have trouble with this uh, older compilation that doesn't meet uh, Apple's security rules. Um, I'll have a new compilation that does, um, but uh, I don't want to get messed up in that right now. And um, so you can see there's two steps. <clears throat> There's a, a Java execution of the model assembler uh, executable class, which uh, uh, takes the um, the Olinghouse.in file, and it's supposed to put out a file with this name, Olinghouse. Yeah, let's see. Okay, now you can see what I'm doing. Hopefully. Uh, okay, we commented out Java C, and then we have the Java run of the compiled Java. Uh, we already have the compiled Java, and um, the run of model assembler reads this Olinghouse.in, which we we also got out, um, and that's uh, this file here. Um, And um, and then here, this uh, this greater than means that it's going to take uh, it. It outputs um, <clears throat> a dot in file, which we then call Olinghouse dash ma dot in. It's because it's been run through uh, model assembler. And then when we do our e three d run, um, we are going to uh, we are going to read that file. E three d is going to read that file. <clears throat> Okay, so um, now I'm, we're going to run this on cogs, which means that we can just say uh, e3d. We don't have to use any of the path information. All right, so I'll remove that incorrect path. So uh, you know we do have to edit the uh, the run.sh. No help. Um, what that means is that uh, we can log into cogs. We can start the e3d job. And then uh, we can log out. It won't hang up when we log out. Okay. It, usually, when you most programs that are running, you know, when you uh, log into a Unix system, um, when you hang up, when you log out, it will send send uh, your shell when it's hung up on will will send a hang up signal against all the processes running underneath it. Um, and this is telling the shell, don't send a hangup signal to E3D, to the E3D job. And it will continue to run in the background. OK? So, um, um, and also in some shells, uh, maybe in Bash, which we want to be careful with right now, because I don't think Bash has been patched on any system that I have yet. Um, so, uh, Hopefully, I won't uh, live to regret saying that on video. Um, uh, in Bash, uh, it'll also take all of the uh, standard output and standard error output that you get from running programs, and it will put it into a file called uh, 
nohub.out or something like that, kind of a log file. And that actually, when you're running 3D, that actually contains uh, useful information, that uh, nohub.out. No um, all right. So um, we're going to um, uh, we're going to try we're going to assemble the model. We're going to run model assembler right here on this Mac, and um, and we're not going to run E3D just yet. All right. So model assembler is going to take the Olinghouse.in input file. It's going to use all of these other uh, data files that we have uh, have downloaded. Uh, the Jockins Basin Depth, the Reno Abbott, the Jockins Geology, the uh, uh, the uh, VS30 uh, Remy uh, data. It's going to assemble those into these maps that we asked for, um, and uh, and it's going to write out all of that stuff in addition to the new uh, .in file. Okay, so um, and we'll we'll take a look at what the differences are between the um, the uh, .in file and uh, the the two .in files. So uh, uh, we're going to make a trial of, of creating the model uh, before we uh, and we're going to inspect the model, inspect the three D model before we go ahead and run E three D. Okay, so I got to save that. And um, now this is the uh, input file, which uh, hopefully uh, begins with some helpful information. And here's where these different parameter lines are. There's the platform line, one of those allowed. The grid line, one of those allowed. The one source line we have, we could have more. Um, the uh, the rules line, uh, we need multiple V file lines, okay, which define um, how E3D is going to. These are the uh, file names that the um, uh, that the uh, um, that the property um, matrices get get written uh, to by um, uh, by model assembler. Okay, um, there's our oops, our two basin lines. Um, there's our one geotech layer line. There's the one time definition line, and then here's all of our output uh, definition lines. And so there's a few comments in there. To hopefully uh, help you. Now, the very the, the nice thing about uh, both Model Assembler and E three uh, D, as well as its successors, okay, is that um, uh, it can take a it can read in a, a line type. You know, you can have a line type and, and a parameter within a line type. That it doesn't know about, and it'll just pass it through. It won't. Uh, it won't hang up on on anything. Um, so, uh, you know, the um, the image uh, image line that means something to E three D. The amplif lines don't mean anything to E three D, but they mean something to model assembler, and we can just have them all in there, no problem. Uh, and then you can see these file names are the uh, the ones uh, that are going to get um, um, uh, the files that these will come out on. And um, I hadn't changed the name uh, of the uh, SAC file output, so it's suggesting that it's in Sun binary, but of course it won't be. Uh, we did set it so that we'll here you know we'll know that it's Intel binary, um, and that's true of all of all the other. Uh, uh, no, that's true of, of the the other of the image outputs, but the amplif the amplification uh, outputs, which come out of uh, model assembler, those are going to be uh, raw IEEE or old IEEE float. Okay. Um, so uh, notice uh, notice that the. Uh, um, uh, here, uh, say in the source line, uh, there is the uh, the lat and lawn, okay, and you might know that a source line for E three D, you know, it requires not latitude and longitude coordinates; it requires grid coordinates, and that's also the job of model assembler to insert the correct grid coordinates, 
uh, it's going to append those to the end of the source line. And um, E3D is not going to care. You know, it's not looking for lat and lon in a source line. It's just wanting to find the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, LMN uh, grid coordinates of the uh, 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 from a source line. Same thing with grid. You know, we've got lat zero and lon zero. Uh, E3D ignores those. It's expecting to find grid co uh, grid coordinates, um, and um, uh, and you can see that model assembler or uh, uh, MACME, the interface has inserted the uh, number of grid points in uh, each direction. Let's see. N is the x direction. M is the depth direction, and L is the um, is the uh, um, the uh, y direction, the northing. So n is easting, l is northing, m is depth. And if you use your left hand, not your right hand, use your left hand to take your fingers from the x, uh, from the x, uh, the positive x direction, uh, and swing them to the um, to the the uh, positive y direction in l, which is northing. So you're swinging from from uh, easting to northing. Your thumb, of course, on your left hand points down, which means that uh, m increases down. So E3D and, um, and, uh, um, uh, and model assembler use this uh, left hand coordinate system. And that's going to have certain uh, impacts when we look at the outputs. OK. Uh, the thing that I left out of here is I should have put in comments, like for each source, I should have put in a comment about the, the total moment. Um, by the time we get to the E3D uh, input line, uh, you know that's not the total moment that we put in. That's uh, many orders of magnitude less. That is the, the amplitude, the moment in dyne centimeter of the... Um, of the um, uh, that's put onto each grid element along the fault, okay, and then you have to go through, you know, how big the grid is and how big the fault is and what dH is, right? The uh, grid element spacing. That's how you figure out what the total moment is, and the MACME uh, uh, interface has handled that all for us. So it's put the total uh, <clears throat> the total moment. Uh, uh, we should be, uh, you know. Uh, inserting a comment here that says what the total uh, moment is, and the um, and and thus the uh, the total um, uh, magnitude of the of that source, um, and I didn't uh, you know that's not part of the uh, the output, so I'm going to go back to the uh, the interface, and um, I'm going to see uh, what it says, and I'm going to insert that. Um, so I'll copy this line out of the uh, this, the CME interface, and I'm going to add that as a comment, you know, starting with a hash, um, to the uh, that that source line. So uh, <clears throat> just something to uh, to keep in mind. Um, um, you know, because. Uh, you know, tomorrow I will totally forget that this was a magnitude 6.5 earthquake in total. <clears throat> I'll totally, uh, totally forget that. Uh, okay, so then I'll, uh, I'll save it. So let's go ahead and, um, and we will run our, our run.sh script, and it's going to assemble the model. Um, let's see. So I will. Uh, uh, I'll let that be. Go here. I've CD to where I have the uh, uh, where I have the uh, the files. Uh, which, uh, if you don't know it, it's very nice on a Mac. You can type CD and then drag the uh, the folder into the terminal window, and it will put in the uh, um, the name, the path. Even if it has spaces in it, it'll still work. So uh, that's a very nice uh, facility. Um, 
So we just say uh, the command to run the script is csh run.sh. And we're, uh, you know, we're skipping the compilation, and we're going right into model assembler. It will tell us, you know, if we don't have the right files in the right place, if some of those input files are missing, we've named them, but they're missing, then it'll tell us. Uh, it's giving us this uh, cascade of output about uh, what it's finding um, as it's assembling the, uh, the models. Uh, so let's. Uh, um, okay, so I had a quick bug. So yeah. It's like I forgot to hit apply parameters on the source page. So if anyone gets an error, you should make sure you apply the parameters. Right, right. Um, yeah, that's really uh, on these. Um, on these, uh, um, like here on this on the source page, you know, you can see that the uh, um, the uh, the nature of the uh, of of the the way you interact with the line is different on on uh, the source page compared to you know other pages like. Uh, um, you know, here the uh, the grid the grid line um, that line does get updated. You know, as you're working in here, um, you know, and changing the values and and um, you know, hitting apply is uh, is really just a, a formality. Um, but you look at the source line, and instead of just an apply button, there the supply parameters button means apply the parameters above to the line that's below. Okay, so you can hit that, and it will apply them. Now, I didn't actually want um, my hypercenter strike distance to be uh, negative, so I'll take that out. So that's uh, I'm making a correction. I'll apply parameters uh, again. Um, now we can uh, we can add a, a a source. So maybe I'll I'll add the source uh, now. Um, and now you can see I have two um, I have two source lines. Okay, and now apply parameters won't do anything, um, uh, and it's it's the same deal with the um, the basin and the geotech lines. Um, I have to select one of them in the list below, um, and it will expand. Uh, you know, and I have to apply the uh, uh, the parameters to that. Now I have I should have two identical source lines. Yeah, it looks that way. Um, so uh, you know, I'll change this one back. Apply parameters to the second one now that's uh, that's uh, selected, and now you can see uh, how they're different. Um, and um, I could add uh, I could add uh, more source lines, and uh, you know I can scroll my way through. It's you can see it's a little bit painful. Um, it's not too often that we use more than two or three sources. Um, but um, uh, you can uh, you can do that. So uh, now I got to delete all those. Um, you can select a line, and uh, like this very first line, you can hit Edit Line, okay, and its particular parameters show up uh, here. And so then you can change them, and with that line still selected, you can say Apply Parameters, okay. Now I'm going to delete all the other lines. Um, let's see, one by one, I have to do that. Okay, so we're back to one correct line now. Um, you know, this would be the way to build up a sequence of, of ruptures on fault segments. And uh, uh, E3D, at least, can have um, one uh, over, can have 100 uh, source lines. So uh, you can have that many. Um, segments. Now, of course, uh, if you really do have a complex uh, rupture history that you want to put in, and you have uh, a complex fault geometry, you're probably going to use the uh, distributed slip with with different rise times on every on every single uh, you know node that's passed through by a fault anywhere. So that uh, that will take in this big file, which is described the format of which is described in the E3D documentation. Uh, that's how, for instance, uh, you could go from a um, 
dynamic calculation of rupture to a uh, uh, to a um, uh, to to uh, the kinematic input that E3D and and a lot of these other uh, uh, modelers take. Uh, okay, so uh, you know I, I don't have any uh, error messages uh, here. Uh, you can see there's a lot of messages. You know, too many for sure. Um, there's some things that 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 you can see. Um, you know, the grid setup. You may want to save these messages. Um, it's giving you information about the size of the grid. Uh, again, uh, n is in the x direction, m is in depth, and l is is uh, in the y direction. It's telling you the total number of nodes, um, and um, it's also telling you uh, useful things like what are the lats and lawns that the grid uh, uh, extends to, uh, and also it gives you the uh, the correspondence of node indices to uh, um, to uh, lats and lawns. You know, this is part of the thing that Model Assembler does, and uh, this is especially hard to figure out. I'm not going to claim that that Model Assembler does it in the absolute best way according to a surveyor um, or a geographer, but uh, it does it in a way that's good enough for most of the grids that we use. Um, so uh, uh, you know, if you have a tilted grid, uh, you know, it's really hard to figure out where the corners are, and Model Assembler will tell you right here. Um, and uh, you know, you can see how it read through the, the input files. Um, you can see uh, it, it gives you examples of, of values that are in those input files. Um, just so you can verify what you have in your in your input, uh, it tells you what kinds of basin thicknesses it's finding. It's interesting here; it just you know randomly landed on one uh, that's a, a very substantial basin thickness, 1.8 kilometers. That's got to be somewhere below the Virginia range. Um, it's not in the Reno basin. Um, and then uh, it, it'll give you the minimum and maximum ba basin thicknesses it finds. Uh, gives you the minimum and maximum geology values, uh, which if you're trying to debug a geology file, you may need to know. Uh, minimum and maximum geotechnical shear velocities. For instance, uh, I'm a little bit surprised that we have a uh, geotechnical velocity as small as 195 uh, Wait. Yeah, so it said uh, the minimum there. I've got to correct that. The minimum there says uh, meters per second, but that's got to be kilometers per second. So that would be 195 meters per second, 0 0.195 kilometers per second. Okay. Um, and then it tells you, uh, you know, that it's uh, it's writing uh, various uh, uh, various files. So now, if we look in the uh, um, the list of files. Uh, and we organize it by, uh, uh, huh? And it did not write the. Um, it wrote the maps, but it didn't write the. Um, and it should have told us that it wrote the uh, the volumes. Uh, that's interesting. Let's see. We've got the V file specifications. It should have written, uh, you know, VP dot float, VS dot float, etc. Um, so uh, maybe there's something wrong with my rules file. Uh, okay. Uh, we still we can see how well it's uh, it's assembling things. Yeah, there's something wrong here because uh, so maybe I should recompile it. Yeah. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, run it again. So uh, just hit the up arrow in uh, TCSH here that I'm using, and, and I can uh, CSH run.sh again. OK. And I had an error. Let's see. Ah, so no wonder that rules.java is uh, is failing. 
Um, you know, uh, uh, reading and writing from disk has a um, has a, an error rate these days of um, uh, you know about one in uh, ten to the tenth. But if you're used to reading and writing gigabytes and gigabytes, uh, you occasionally get a, a an error in the binary. Um, so let us replace this rules.java. What? It's like an extra wide minus sign. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know what? I probably opened uh, uh, rules.java in a uh, in a uh, uh, yeah, because this is this is taken down a long chain of uh, of changes. Um, so no, wait a minute. This is this came from the yeah. This came directly from the compressed archive. So I should rewrite that as well. This is line thirty nine. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, maybe uh, uh, you know if you're if you're used to using. Oh yes, thank you. Ah, so maybe I can't blame Yosemite, huh? There it is. The eye has no problem with it. So that's the um, that's the uh, uh, yeah. That was even in a comment, but uh, you know, if it's not within the code's uh, you know ASCII character set, forget it. Yeah. So of course I pasted that from Word, and. Uh, and so it's going to have some funny characters. OK. Well, we try again. OK. So I'm getting the uh, usual messages that say that my, col my code is way too old. That's fine. That's a, that's a known uh, feature. Um, we'll we'll know in just a second. Okay, so now now okay. Here's the correct run. It's giving us all the same information, but now it's saying wrote plane. You know, n of uh, these are l. You know, l planes uh, as we go north. So it's it has written the the files, and uh, and there they are. Density dot float. Uh, there's the Olinghouse dash ma. Uh, there's uh, QP, QS, yeah, um, and it's written a couple of maps. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, basin uh, depth map and the uh, geotechnical velocity map, map vels and map depth. Um, so uh, we open up uh, ViewMat and um, uh, we're going to. Uh, uh, let's see. Let me bring that over here. Okay. Um, and we're going to open the. Uh, uh, it's a it's a raw binary file. Um, and so I need to go to Olinghouse, and um, let's check out the basin depth map first, and that is a. Uh, um, a raw, f it's a raw, old IEEE float. There's no bytes to skip, but we got to know the uh, the dimensions of it, uh, how many samples there are, and that's all up here in the uh, in the uh, rules uh, uh, in the output of the model assembler. It's also in the rules file. Okay, let's check. Let's let me find it for you in the rules. I'm sorry, in the uh, .in file, the Olinghouse.in. You look on the grid line. The map is going to be, you know, L samples, 294 samples north south, and uh, 387 samples east west. 
uh, in this case. The, um, so the number of samples per vector is going to be 387. Elements per vector, 387. Uh, the vectors per plane is going to be 294. OK, and this is a map, so there's just one plane. All right. Um, Yeah, uh, this is fairly uh, fairly smooth. Ah, so you must yeah you you right you're uh, looking at purely at the uh, <clears throat> well what you can see on my screen is um, there's uh, larger depths and so let's let's get this uh, get this plotted in a in a better way uh, with uh, by editing the uh, the plot parameters. So I didn't I must not have got your Abbott. Yeah, yeah, you don't have the uh, the Abbott uh, uh, base Reno basin depths in there. It might have it might have said somewhere in that cascade of output. It, it might have said, um, okay, basin depths are positive only. Um, yeah, basin thickness. I used uh, Jockin's basin depth. Yeah. So I need to swap out or just add yours as well as the second line because ah. that will get. See, my Abbott ones are overprinting. But you know, maybe you should run it with just the Jockins base index, okay. right? These are two different scenarios, right? Okay. It's the same. We could run the same fault, Everything but we're running sense. we're running different geology, okay? And running different geology, well, that means that um, uh, that that we could well see different results, okay? So I like to uh, plot these uh, um, like this. Um, and you can see that they're okay now. Now, the map is not making sense yet, and the reason is is that uh, uh, the as we go from vector zero index zero to higher indices, we're going north, but that's coming up on the screen pointing down. So it's like a mirror image. So we need to mirror this around the uh, 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 around the uh, uh, horizontal axis. And uh, in view mat, you uh, you pick on each vector mirror, and you mirror the whole thing. All right. So now we have um, actually this this big low here is under the Pawra range, Sorry, John, northeast of Sparks. Missed what you did. Went to methods. Yeah, methods on each uh, on each vector and uh, and mirror. So you're seeing kind of a, a, a less detailed view of the uh, of the uh, Reno and Sparks Basin, right? You know the the Jock is, yeah, yeah, it's there. Yeah, then that's uh, that's the volcanic basin that's up on top of the Carson Range, or actually it's uh, it's uh, southeast of Truckee. There's a bunch of volcanics up there, and the uh, the the Abbott and Louis map doesn't have that, so. You know, it's a little bit artificial. Well, probably more than a little bit. It's pretty artificial what I'm doing, right? Because um, uh, you know, maybe I should I should merge the two maps with um, um, and and take the greatest depth that's available. You know, between the different layers. Or uh, yeah, there should you should have your selection of operators. That's going to be a huge waveguide. Right. Right. So. Uh, uh, that's why we need to run both scenarios. We need to run both yeah. geologies. Yeah. You know the. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what the amplifications, uh, despite the lack of those uh, those side basins, if we're computing, if we're computing um, motions in Reno, okay, those uh, um, those are going to be much larger uh, with the Abbott and Louis uh, because the basin edges are much sharper. Uh, yeah, the center of this low spot is uh, is at West McCarran and uh, Mayberry. So it's a bit west of downtown. Downtown is like almost here. So you can see that there's a, a normal fault, which uh, bounds the east side of. It's a west dipping normal fault that bounds the east side of the 
the what I call the Re West Reno Basin. Okay, so uh, uh, we just have uh, a few more minutes, and um, um, so I think what I'll do is uh, let's also check out. Uh, we're not going to plot it properly. Um, you know, I should have a whole tutorial on how to plot these maps. Let's also take a look at the uh, um, at the uh, uh, the geotechnical map, um, and that is a uh, a raw float. That's that that's the one that says Map Vels. It's got the exactly the same dimensions, so uh, we can just read it in. It's going to substitute. And I, I use different parameters than I have before, and you can see the result. Uh, I used also well. Okay, we've got to take it as uh, uh, got to mirror that as well for it to make geographic sense. Okay, so uh, uh, also I like to use a different color table. Um, I like to use this lithologic age one and the amplitude clip at 1.52. What that does is that uh, Neherp uh, soil class BC boundary is right in the middle between green and blue. And blue is higher velocity and safer. And, and, um, and uh, 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 yellow and red are. Uh, are lower velocity and less safe. And so there's the Reno transect, the 50 values associated with that that are coming out there. OK, so we've got a good view. I mean, I'm willing to go with this uh, with both of these maps. Uh, and uh, so next time, we'll, uh, we'll check that out.